Thank you for joining us for the Hyper Fast Show. I'm Carrie Scholl. And I'm Dan Lesniak. And today we're going to be interviewing one of our idols, Gary Vandercheck. So we are so excited to deliver amazing lessons from our time with him. And um, we're going to get started. So recently we were able to sit down with Gary V uh, after an event where he came to the D.C. area and... You know, he was out there with Tony Robbins and Robert Hervcheck from Shark Tank, Joseph McClendon, who's also a, a big Tony Robbins guy. So it was an amazing event that we got to go to. And afterwards, Carrie and I and Matt O'Neill, who's another real estate agent and friend of ours, as well as Lisa Perez, who's a, an entrepreneur, we all got to sit down with Gary Vee in a private setting. And that's what the show is going to be based on today. So we're super excited to kick that off, sh uh, show you, you know, our talk with him and, and just tons of lessons out there for real estate agents, salespeople, entrepreneurs. And before we jump in, I just want to share with you guys, this meeting with Gary Vandercheck changed the course of how we're running our company and has dramatically, it's been about what, 90 days? 90 days. We've already implemented a little bit of it, but really probably not even 80% of it, just some of it. And it's really changed what we've done and, and we're already seeing the results. So when you're listening to this, take notes. I mean, if you're listening in the car, listen to it again, because this can change the direction of your future. And for us, 90 days later, we already know it's just made tremendous impact on our business and what we're doing with our business of Hyperfast. So let's get started. Dan Lesniak, here with my wife, Carrie Scholl. We run one of the biggest real estate teams in this area. We've had that position for three years. So, Perfect timing. Yeah, I, I, I love this segue. <laughs> Going back to your Instagram, Facebook uh, advertisement yes. advice, and how this is a golden era, yes. just like Google used yep. to be for you, how would you advise a company what, like ours? Are you trying to sell homes or recruit agents? Both. Run ads against people in the zip codes or the 40 mile radius for the homes and then make videos of why, literally her filming you, you filming her, of why she should join your brokerage or team versus someone else is how you do this. You can literally target people that are fans of Remax, Wagner, you know, Berkshire Half. You can literally target people who are agents and then say, hi, I'm Chris, I'm Rick, I'm Sally. Our firm's better because of this, and then run the ads, and then 17 of the 500 people that see it will inquiry, and you'll meet them for a coffee, and four of those 17 will join your team. And would you take resources away from direct mail, radio, things that still work for us, yes. just like you said you wish yes, you could have done? Yes, I would, because I think those things are overpriced. Like, you may struggle at first to get Facebook right, so then you're like, fuck, Gary's a fucking idiot. You know, direct mail works better than Facebook. It doesn't. It doesn't. It's just that you have to get good at it. The good news with Facebook, unlike direct mail, your first ad can be $25. Somebody emailed me this morning on the way here, right? You've lived it, you know. Somebody emailed me today and said, my uncle's been making fun of you as a tattoo artist for four years because he hears me in the background. He finally ran $25 worth of Facebook ads and got six clients. He now believes in you. Direct mail has a minimum buy, right? right? You gotta buy a minimum. You gotta print out paper. Facebook is twenty dollars. Five dollars. See something? So go test and learn. Thank you. So the clip you just saw was actually a, a clip at the event. You know, only a few people, the front row. Uh, people got to actually ask Gary a question. So we were lucky enough to be able to do that. And it was really cool having, you know, Carrie there and, and Matt there because we had two different people, you know, filming. So Carrie, you saw get up close filming Gary. Matt uh, was, was filming me and Gary. So just really awesome, unique perspective. And it was really cool to actually see him on stage, you know, saying if, if you're using social media, you know, you need to focus on, delivering awesome content and, and just going around filming and documenting. And he actually like called this out on stage. You heard him say, you know, you filming her, her filming you, what you're doing now here. Uh, it was just a really cool interaction. You know, my big takeaway from that was we are in a, a golden era right now in social media. You know, there's eyeballs on it. People are spending three, four hours a day on social media. That's more than, than they're spending on TV. Plus it's, it's dynamic. You're getting feedback and, you know, he actually detailed, 
you know, in that clip, like the cost per mm -hmm. CPM and, and it's just a way cheaper message or a way to get your message out. Absolutely. And you have demographic information. So if there's a specific target that you're trying to get to, one of the tremendous advantages with digital and social is that you can really hone in and talk to the person you want to talk to. So um, it was cool to watch Dan be able to ask that question and get that real time feedback. And of course, that made us even more excited for when we got to meet Gary later privately. So I'm going to share an interesting story with you. So we were supposed to meet him at eight o'clock. And then at 10, 8 to 10, we were doing a private dinner. So that's the way this started. And at 6.30, we got a message, and it said, it was a text message that Dan got, and it basically said, you know, we're sorry to inform you, we got the time of the dinner wrong, and um, you need to rush to the hotel right away. <laughs> this is at 6.30, and we're like, what? And Tony was on stage at the time. Yeah, and Tony, we just did Tony's Platinum Partnership for a year, and this was the first time we'd seen so Tony since Platinum Partnership. So we were really committed to being there, seeing Tony. And so we kind of, the four of us, our friend Lisa and Matt, as Dan said, and the two of us are sitting there and we're like, holy crap, like this is, this is not good. Yeah, what's going and, on? <laughs> and what was funny, in that exact moment, Tony was on stage and he was talking about a friend of his, Dean Grossier. Am I saying his name right? Close enough. <laughs> yeah, Dean Gracier, we also he's incredible. I got to meet him this year as well. Um, but he was saying how he had this conversation about only suffering, for, for taking a few seconds when something goes wrong and then figuring out how to move forward and how to solve it. And so he was on stage saying that, and I go, well, wait a minute. I'm about ready to suffer over the fact that I'm late for this dinner. I want to see Tony. We're caught in this whirlwind. And so I said, wait a minute, guys. I got it. And I stepped out and I said, hey, uh, I, I called Gary's agent and I said, look, what we'd like to do is go ahead and fly on Gary's plane back to wherever he's going with him. We're going to interview him privately. We're, we're going to miss the dinner. And then we'll just head straight home and we'll take care of getting back. So I'm thinking, I'm imagining the four of us, Gary hanging out on his private plane, sipping a glass of champagne or sparkling water if you're me since I'm pregnant <laughs> with baby number three. Um, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, this is going to be amazing. And I'm super excited. And so the lady on the other end said, oh, well, actually, I used to run Tony's Platinum Partnership Program. So I totally understand why you want to see Tony. Makes perfect sense. Um, what I'm going to do is talk to Gary and I'll get right back to you. So I go in and I'm like, guys, we might be able to go in Gary's private plane. Like, I'm super pumped. Um, and she ended up calling back and she said, bad news. He's, he's actually not flying private, he's flying commercially, and we checked and there's no extra tickets on the plane. So we're like, oh shoot. But the point is, we kept going, we didn't get discouraged, and we just kept brainstorming how to solve it. So we could have been in a dark place having dinner with Gary, and instead, we got to meet him in a really private setting with just the four of us and have the conversation that you're about to hear. So the lesson I took from that moment is, like figure out how to make lemonade out of lemons, right? We could have just been angry and wanted our money back and not got this experience that the result is it changed the course of our career. So without further ado, we're gonna jump right into our conversation with Gary. Yeah, so we, we start off, the first thing I ask him, it's actually not on camera, because I didn't, you know, I would assume we'd be able to film, but I wanted to ask him and I was like, hey, you're, you're cool with us filming our conversation, you know, on our iPhones here. and. You know, he documents his whole entire life, basically. Like, uh, I know, um, ah, it's slipping my name. Uh, uh, D-Rock, that's who, yeah, D-Rock basically follows him around, takes photos, he's always wearing a wire, you know, recording everything. But I just wanted to make sure. So I asked him about it and he, you know, kind of went into a funny story and it, uh, it was probably about a decade ago that he decided like, yeah, everything I do has got to be uh, above board because it's going <laughs> to all be recorded. That. Yeah. Right. I'm kind of. I mean, we're we're starting. We have videographers that work on our team now. We're starting to go there because of Gary's advice, but it's new for us. And sometimes, uh, sometimes what they we're, we haven't practiced that much. So sometimes what they catch on film is pretty hilarious. Uh, and you'll hear him talking about that. Basically, in 2007, I kind of deeply understood that I was going to live my life on the record. And it really, you know, I think a lot of things that people are struggling with now, as I lose my wedding ring, uh, don't lose that. Is, no, <laughs> is something that I, uh, is something that I reconciled a long time ago. 
being very public. Just, just kind of knew how it, like, you know, a lot of your, you know, when you're right about how things are gonna play out, you play them out. In 2007, I was like, everything's gonna be recorded. There will be no hiding. And I was already, like, so, thank God, raised well, and I'm a good dude, like, no sexual harassment or things of that nature. But I would, no question, feel comfortable in saying I'm a better man today, knowing 10 years ago that this is the way it was gonna play out. Not that I was gonna do any of the gross stuff, but, like, silly stuff, like, I, I, I actually remember the moment, it's kind of funny to say, my brother-in-law got married, and we went to Vegas, and everyone's like, let's go to the strip club, and I remember <laughs> not going and just playing blackjack, and it was because I thought, what if somebody films it, puts it on Twitter, I just don't want my wife to have to deal with something like that, even though that was her brother. Yeah. Like, so if there's any time you can kind of get the free pass, you know? Yeah. And I just remember that was like the big moment, where I was like, just basically default, basically I default into every single interaction I have in life is actually secretly being recorded, and will I be okay with that being on record? And it. And, I'm, and a lot of my optimism comes from the fact that I can feel like I went from a nine to a 9.5 as a human, and thus thinking like once people catch up to what I know, everybody will be slightly better. And another thing, which is I think as we get exposed through technology, everybody's gonna know that people have flaws. We all have skeletons. Every one of us right now, if it was like real, real talk, like tomorrow we all die, has something they could say that they're not the most fucking proud you, you of. Think, you think the, uh, yeah. you think, I think that that's gonna come that, out though? I, I mean, do, brother. Because I think it's, it's going the opposite way. Everybody's putting on this fake persona. No, but they can't hide. You can put up a it's fake persona, out. but you're gonna get caught. You're like gonna if get you're, filmed you're gonna get point. filmed. Like if you're, like, you can't hide. But then, and then somebody gets filmed and the whole world shames on them. Well, Rather to, than be, saying, to be the question becomes, what, to your point, what are we, I think we'll go through the shaming and then we'll go through the understanding. We shamed on alcoholism and drug use and, and then we go to understanding. I think the big one is infidelity, yeah. to be very frank. I think like that's the, and it was interesting, a woman really kind of educated me first on it. Uh, I think, I think there's a lot we're gonna go through. Mental health, infidelity, I think there's a lot we're gonna have to go through. I think we're going through the most fascinating next 50 years. And I'm very optimistic about it. Yeah. I think when we start having more thoughtful, truthful conversations with each other, we'll be in a much better place. All right, so in this next segment, uh, I, I talked to Gary about you know, what has changed in Facebook and social media because what I was doing in 2012, I thought you know, back then was, was really groundbreaking and, and, and working well but I didn't really update it quick enough. I didn't, you know, change the strategy. So he, he talks about, you know, how do you know when things shift? And he gives a couple examples, like how a snow skier, you know, knows when the snow is good and not, or not, you know, how someone who's tasting something or wearing a shoe knows if it's good or not. And, you know, it's just really interesting to hear. And I think what he was trying to say was, you know, you gotta, you gotta get in the, in the dirt, you know, like his new shoes, the clouds and dirt, you, you have to be, you know, down, you know, on the, 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 the worker B level, no matter how big you've grown your business, like in the practice. And, and I think he, he does that himself. Like he's in the social media, he's, he's in, in the business. And that's how you know when things shift. You gotta be on the ground floor. So, so take a listen. I think this is a really awesome segment. I had an awesome start my first year. I came out Killed the me. gates, did like 22 million. Why? Carry. Why? Yeah. I focused on a super narrow yeah, target. Okay. I focused on 200 buildings, the condo I lived in, and it was like, no one's gonna, gonna get a fucking sale in here that I don't know about. Like, I got half the market share, like 50%. Just, like, grunted into success. Yeah, like... Willed it. Like, like, grinded, like, went to the, the manager, the front yeah, desk grind. lady. Human like, did it. Hey, do you know who's moving? And, and Okay, she dropped names every like two weeks. They'd get a note under the door. People and, skills. Yeah. yeah, I understand. I did a okay. little bit of Facebook back then too, because it was this was 2012. It was super cheap to buy likes for the page, and mm -hmm. I think I maybe was a little too early. Like I blew blew yeah. that up, and then nothing kind of happened, well, and it sat you know, there. My, my look, other stuff it was, changed. was working. It changed. You know, like built like in 2010, 11, 12, it was good to buy 
likes, get a page, and then get organic reach. It was like building a list. It changed. You know, I think like anything, like everything evolves. Like, I mean, I, you know, I talk about Google building my business in 2001 too, but in 98, 99, direct mail was killing it for me. It changed. So where how do you, you know you? when to make a transition? Yeah. By being in your shit. You know, what's great about being a practitioner is you know. You know, really, you'll love this. I don't even know why, because I've never really, I've skied twice, but for some reason when you asked that, I was like, the same way somebody who skis every day knows the snow's not good. I don't know. Like, I know if I taste wine, if it's good or not, because I've tasted fucking two billion wines. Right? right? Like, yeah. you know, I don't know if you care about shampoo or shaving or like, you know, what have you done so many times repetitively that you know? Nobody will ever put a Pepsi and a Coke in front of me and ask me which one's Coke or Pepsi and trick me, ever. I just drank too much Pepsi and Coke. But if you've never had a Pepsi and Coke, you have no fucking idea. You also have a palate. Sure, but I mean, it, it's, it's back to, you know, it's why I use shampoo or like, like, when you do something all the time, you know. If you buy the same sneakers, same brand, and for some reason there's something off on a pair, but you've worn them 44 different times. Literally, you bought the same sneakers for the last nine years. You're gonna know. Context. How do I know? I do it every day. Just for those of you that are watching in the studio today, let's see those shoes, dude. <laughs> I mean, these are pretty freaking badass. Yeah, so these are the, the new uh, Gary V Clouds and Dirt, the dark edition. I got the white edition, which is pretty cool, because. Uh, Braden, Does it actually see the know, clouds and dirt under here like the other ones? Braden, my son, uh, you know, wears them. The clouds and dirt's on the inside tongue. So this is the the dirt shoe. So it says, uh, what does it say there? The the work, the hustle, the grind on, on here. And and the this is the clouds. It says the the macro, the, the mission, the motive. So you've got to kind of, you know, have your bigger goals up here, your 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 purpose. Then you got to be down here, um, you know, working on it, getting your fingers dirty. Uh, so I, I love the metaphor. Gary goes on in, in other, you know, places to talk about how, you know, too many times people live, uh, you know, in the middle, and you got to kind of be at both ends. So, quick little. Uh, side, uh, note side note. By his wife, who had to point out that he is wearing the shoes. Um, Okay, so do we want to talk about mass business for a minute? Yeah, so in this next next segment here, uh, you know, Matt O'Neill starts asking uh, Gary what he should do specifically, you know, with his social media strategy. Matt is a real estate agent down in Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, he's actually in my GoBundance uh, pod group. So I'm, I'm in a GoBundance network. Uh, it's, it's an awesome group started by David Osborne, Tim Rhodes, and Pat Hyben, if you guys don't know them. But it's, it's for uh, you know men that want to create wealth, create businesses. And, and there's a lot of groups that focus on that. This group also focuses on having amazing relationships, doing bucket list adventures. And there's about 200 people in it now, but the, they have these little accountability groups with four to six people in them. We call them go pods and they are awesome. We're on a call every two weeks, reviewing our goals, holding each other accountable. And it's, it's awesome being on the call with Matt because he's a top notch realtor. He's going to sell close to $200 million this year. He's got an amazing team down in Charleston and super glad he was able to make this and, you know, check out what advice Gary has for him and, and how to implement social media, how it's shifted, how to do it effectively. And, and real quick, I also interviewed Matt. So you get to hear about his business, how he's built it, what his super strengths are when I was in New York City filming with Barbara Corcoran. So that's one of the future podcasts coming up. Now we'll jump right into the rest of Gary's message and what we learned from him. I'm trying to blow it up locally. I'm in Charleston, South Carolina. Yeah, I mean, to me, that fires me up because buying ads on Instagram and Facebook for Charleston, South Carolina, and just pounding that. Like, like you're running for mayor. Yeah. Well, just work. I don't know what else to tell you. Now, there's a very interesting nuance I have been saying for a decade in real estate, and the few people that have done it have won. My uh, big thing is that you should be the, you should basically, what's the local papers in Charleston? Post and Courier. That's who your competitor is. Be the Post and Courier. I couldn't believe in it more. 
I genuinely believe if you made a viral video on Main Street, like who else is pissed about this pothole? Because everybody knows. The same way everybody knows Joe's makes the best fucking hoagie. The same way that fucking everybody knows that the best ice cream was Carl's. The same way that everybody knows the principal in the high school's a dick. The same way that like, I'm such a believer of localized content, you couldn't imagine. I can win over any Jets fan in America in four minutes by just spitting shit that only hardcore Jet fans know. That's the advantage of small town. You guys could make a joke about the pothole on Main Street in Charleston, South Carolina that literally would get all the views on Facebook from everybody in town because it's the inside fucking joke. Literally read cover to cover, read, skim. What the Charleston, one more time, I apologize. Post and Courier. The Post and Courier writes about and then make videos, versions of basically the similar shit on Facebook. That's ridiculously good advice. Smart, Thank you. I love that. that. Thank you. I literally, you can get the Post and Courier in the morning be like, well, everyone's talking about the fire post. I'm gonna go with my phone and interview the fire chief, post it on Facebook, run $100 worth of ads to people that live in Charleston, South Carolina, and fucking dominate. Yeah. And that's it's how, killing. And that's how you blow call up. Call action you're the, on that, or nope, just give you're just like building you, brand, or? because they're gonna click your face and be like, who the fuck's this dude? In, who is he? Click, real estate guy. Oh, weird, I'm selling my home, DM. And if you really don't even care about anything happening for three or four months, and you're just building brand, you will have all the leverage. Be the mayor of your town if you're in the real estate business. I couldn't believe it anymore. My sister just got into real estate and she's, you know, like, she, luckily she's listening. She usually doesn't listen to me. <laughs> it's cool to watch. She's like reviewing town stores. She's like, this is the best, you know? What would your advice be we, we're, to us? We're starting a new venture. We're gonna take what we've done, you know, helping buyers and sellers and, and agents on our team and try to expand it nationally to like an educational platform that you know people follow us, they're a part of a, a community, uh, we have courses. To me, the, the answer to your question is the most non-intuitive thing ever, which is give away content for free at scale. Which is so not intuitive. Literally, you're selling content. How the fuck is the strategy giving away content? Because the answer is, if you make what you, to me what I would do if I was selling information is layer access on top of it. So whatever you're selling for 500 bucks or 5,000 bucks or 50,000 bucks, add once a week or once a month a Facebook group live stream so that you can then do what I'm doing right now, right? Yeah. Like, listen, I gave a really good keynote today. I could feel it, it was a good one. Yeah, yeah it, was awesome. right? it was awesome. It was awesome. But look what just happened here when it's just the five of us. You can give me the specific question, I can give you the specific answer, and you're like, whoa, that's really good advice. And that might be literally the breakthrough. Yes. Right? That is the breakthrough. Or you guys are sitting here and like, we're gonna sell information, and this fucking guy who we respect, to, uh, obviously to some level, otherwise we wouldn't be sitting here, why is he telling us to give away content for free? That's the breakthrough. Because what Karen in Kansas knows is you've given away all this good stuff for free, which already puts you way above everyone else, so now I'm actually gonna pay you to ask you the very specific question about Tamika. Okay. I mean, what are you guys doing here? I fucking give away all my best shit for free. Do you understand? Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. And the, and, and the level of graciousness that you're bringing to this situation with the wrong email, like just reverse engineer yourself. Like you paid a lot of money, we had a mix up. So we lose an hour and a half and we're getting 15 minutes and you're happy and you're gracious about it. That's the actual meta insight to what you two should be doing. How do you get to a place where that becomes real? Yeah. So how much do you have right? to Because, what, to because what happens otherwise, I apologize and I'll explain in a minute, I'll answer that. Here's why it's liberating and here's why I'm different and in whatever way that you've sensed it or figured it out. I don't have agenda against the stuff that you guys consume every day. Think about it. If tomorrow you're putting out a Facebook piece of content and the agenda is to be a top of funnel piece of content to get somebody to pay you 7,000 bucks, you're pretty fucked. It's like a guy going up to the bar looking to sleep with the girl tonight. They don't fall for that shit. <laughs> They know. That's what they, they're born to know. A woman understands that intuitively at a young age. Like, you know, 
right? Yes. Now look, you might be the most fucking handsome guy ever and like whatever, right? But cool, those odds are not as good, right? I basically believe in the romance. I believe in the courtship. I believe in the actual relationship. Great stuff. Right? It's yeah. a really brain fuck because I'll tell you, I guarantee everybody, nine, I mean I live it, I know it, I watch it, I watch it for a decade. That is not the advice you're getting from other people. What incredible advice from Gary Vee. So Dan and I have already just jumped on this opportunity and started doing stories to help us be the mayor of our town. We did one on the bird scooter, we did another one on dog parks, we've done a ton of restaurant and vendor interviews. He said, you know, the top areas and or the top places in your town. We've been doing all of that. If you wanna see examples of how we're leveraging that and the engagement we're getting, it's incredible. We're getting thousands of views on a segment about bird scooters, right? So um, definitely just go to the Carrie Scholl YouTube page and you can check out what we're doing there. All right, let's hear what's next. What's powerful about what they're doing right now is you can strip the audio and it could be your podcast. Like you literally put out a podcast tomorrow and be like, our podcast with Gary Vee. Things that people court forever. Here it is, you got it right now. Yeah. You know, or you can transcribe it and make it a LinkedIn post and add six or seven sentences and you got something meaningful. What, did you guys see that I put out, it caused a lot of ruckus, that, that deck that shows how I made 86 pieces of content with one keynote? I saw the yes. You I saw, saw the headline but you didn't go in it, good. Go into that. I put out a deck on LinkedIn and on my website of how I made 86 pieces of content off of one keynote. It's very insightful and it's very much, it's back to what I always say, right? Which is like, I'm giving away my best shit but nobody does anything with it. Literally, there is no better verbatim, black and white, tactical piece of content that I put out, yet, you know, 98% of my audience hasn't even consumed it, let alone acted on it. That's because there's so much content. Correct. Yeah. I'm not confused. I hope you guys got as much out of that piece about producing content and getting multiple pieces of content out of one, one thing that you're doing, one speech that you're giving, one interview that you're doing. Dan and I have definitely been focused on that and it's been harder to execute than we would have imagined because getting to the 15 second clip that's the most meaningful takes your team getting on board with being able to strategically decide what's relevant and important to your audience. Um, now I'm gonna dig into a specific question to Gary for real estate agents on prospecting and how to crush their business. So let's hear from him on that. So what would your advice be to real estate agents or salespeople that have a problem prospecting and picking up the phone? You know, look, instead of like razzing them, I mean like, you know, it's funny, there's two parts of me. There's the, uh, <laughs> there's the kind and soft and cuddly and nurturing part of me, which wants to go down the path of like, cool, like, you know, hey dear, I hope you understand. Like, you don't have to prospect or pick up the phone, but please at least respect why you aren't getting the same results as somebody who does. Mm -hmm. It's very sweet, like don't worry. Like, you can be happy not making the most. And then there's the alpha kind of, you know, masculine kind of aggressive part of me that's like, the fuck are you doing? Like, you're in this, like, real estate agents, this is just as nice as I can say it. You're in the selling shit business. You're in the selling business. No matter how much you coddle it, or whatever, you're, you're acquiring the rights to sell something and then you sell it. Picking up, the, like, introverts do not apply. Or, Introverts apply, but don't be sitting at your desk baffled why charismatic Christine is breaking your fucking face every month. Because she's fucking hustling. Because she has humility. Because she doesn't care what people think about her. Cool. That's the truth. That's the real truth. But I really don't have unlimited passion to be like, you should pick up every phone and this and that. My big thing is self-awareness. If you know you're introverted or if you hate picking up the phone, well then you better figure out social media if you hate picking up the phone. And if you love picking up the phone, you better figure out social media so more people <laughs> phone call you, right? Like what I brought up today, like I'm obsessed with like, oh God, I would destroy real estate because I would be the Pied Piper. I would run ads in neighborhoods and throw the party. It's all high school. Think, like take a step back. Who was the kid in your high school that 
had his parents or her parents leave for the weekend and would throw a party. He or she became more popular junior and senior year because they hosted the party. Like, it's so funny how universal this is. No matter who I say it to, they're like, yeah, Craig Thompson. He went from being kind of nerdy to popular because he could throw a party and people could hook up and drink at his house. Thus, he had leverage, thus he elevated, thus the cool kids wanted to hang out with him, and Craig Thompson went from a three to a nine. (laughs) That's what I think real estate agents should do. You should throw the wine dinner in town. You should throw a flower festival in the parking lot. You should go knock on all the doors of all the businesses that are struggling right now and be like, hey, let's do a potpourri potluck event. Like, you should hit up the real estate developer that owns the strip mall that is dead because Amazon's killing them and say, let's turn it into a farmer's market and I'll be the host queen bee. Take control. Use Facebook. It works. That's awesome advice. Cool, right? Very cool. The, what I, the reason that's good advice for me, what it gets me excited is I love this idea of expiring inventory. Expiring inventory. Unlike a home that you list, it's there. Tomatoes are not like that. A Saturday in the summer at a parking lot sitting empty is not like that. It goes away. I just think it's about innovation and hustle. Come up with ideas and do it. So, you could, I apologize, you could in Charleston, South Carolina, you could, you could DM 80 former retired NASCAR drivers. You could get six of them to say yes for a thousand bucks to show up in a parking lot. You could. Yeah. And all of a sudden now you have $6,000 in, but you have an asset. You could, you see where I'm going? You could run ads against NASCAR fans in your 40 mile radius. You could, but like I just made that up on the spot because I'm always on offense. And for some reason people think like they're gonna sign with a brokerage and they should get them leads. (laughs) Exactly. I'm gonna sit on my fucking fat ass and you two are gonna get me leads, yay. Bullshit. That is how it works. I'm a very, I'm a lawyer. So our our model, we don't, we don't, just you know, uh, we don't go out and get agents that produce tons and tons on their own. We get them, we train them our methods, and, and we way, give them our leads. And by the way, and thus, and they you, still should, complain and by the way, and thus you should be massively successful. Let me promise you one thing. I often think like, oh, maybe one day I should do Vayner Realty because the real ROI is building up people's personal brands so that they can, like I, instead of, you're handing them fish, that's the current model for the most successful. I'm like, hmm, I think I can teach them to fish. And I'm actually not scared of them leaving because there's unlimited fucking fishermen. Yeah. Which is true. I'm aware. I'm watching. I'm watching. You know, I think the thing you can even sense here is like, I won't talk about things I don't know. It's not smart for me to do that. All right. So that was a great segment with, you know, Gary talking about just how to use social media, how to be the mayor of your town, really. you know, great question by Kerry. I thought, you know, and he's going into the specifics on, you know, use Facebook, produce relevant content, a lot of great stuff there. And then, and then a, a pretty cool segue on how he's, you know, often thought about getting into the, the real estate market and, and what he would do that's different than the current model. So in this next part, Matt asked Gary, how, how do you instill discipline and hustle in your children? That's a great question. Something that, that I wonder myself because, um, you know, when kids are raised with, you know, having more more privilege, it's easy for them to get lazy, not work as hard. So, awesome question. Let's hear what Gary has to say about that. So, how how are you planning to install hustle in your children? I'm not, because environment is not fakeable. Wow. So my plan is that when they become, it's a conversation my wife and I've been having. I want them to get jobs when they're 13, 14, and I don't want to give them a single dollar. That's the only way you can do it. I'm okay with them getting collateral benefits. So like if we go on a fancy trip to the Four Seasons in the Bahamas, cool, they get to come, they're our fucking kids. But I'm not buying them a trip to go to the Bahamas without us. Somewhere along the line in the next five to seven years, they've gotta become independent and get jobs and actually understand that they've been living in an extreme bubble. 
I've spent a lot of time with a lot of rich kids. The only ones that make it out okay are the ones that had jobs and got cut off. I genuinely believe that. Good, okay. That's, I genuinely believe that. That's, that's the advice I was looking for. That's the advice I'm gonna do. Yeah. And my kids have an extra element, because by the time they get, like in the next five to seven years, I'm gonna be fucking famous. <laughs> so like, that's a whole nother, you know? Mm-hmm. And they already feel it. I was gonna say, you're already famous. Right, and so like, because of the way social media works, like, like we now go out every, like every single time we go out, somebody's asking for a selfie, and people are kind. Most people don't bother you with kids. So like they're feeling it. They, you know, kids are smart. Kids can see that. Like, like even something I won't see while I'm holding their hand and walking, and the person's like, they'll see that. Yeah. So, fuck. It's not just you know the money thing was something I always kind of worried about. Never in my wildest dream did I think I was going to build fame. Just not wasn't part of the kind of like world we grew up with. Like it's not how I thought about it. I was in a liquor store at 34 years old. You know what I mean? It's not what you think. I didn't go to L.A. Uh, so, I think a lot about that, to be honest with you. Yeah. Even, I think the money part's actually really easy. Oh, How yeah. they don't become, like, affect, I, I don't want them to be intimidated or entitled by what my wife and I have created. Right? That's a fine, hmm. two very, right? Two very opposite things. Landing that plane's tough. So coming up, we're gonna hear from my friend Lisa. She was a attorney and decided that that wasn't for her, followed her passion and became a fashion designer and you're gonna hear her talk about a business challenge. Now, there are real estate agents out there that are innovating and coming up with other business ideas surrounding the real estate business. So we decided to leave this in and let you learn from how Gary approaches partnership and how should she should be thinking about the right partner, which could apply to some of you. Let's listen. So I'm a little different in the sense that I'm, I'm a sort of high profile firm, white collar lawyer turned fashion designer. So I'm wearing my own clothes. Um, so cool. Thanks. Good for you. Thank you. And there's a history in my family, um, but nothing that I was personally a part of, but it's sort of... Grandparents, great grandparents. Correct. Go ahead. And uh, so I learned this, I have these ideas for innovations in women's wear, that where there's like a substantive uh, modification to the way clothes are both made and patterned size-wise. Okay. Um, and then I'm also working on the problem of sizing being more inclusive for women, um, and then providing also a really unique sort of retail experience. So I'm trying to do all these things, sort of combine them all together. Uh, it all makes sense. Yep. So my question is about resources. Uh, so right now I'm self-funded and I haven't committed anything. I'm just assembling product and model, etc. I understand. Uh, I've learned over the last couple of years uh, at the hand of this master designer, seamstress, pattern maker who invented her own method of pattern making clothing, how to pattern make. Like I know the ins and outs. Like I, I made the patterns for this. Like I can sew, I can make like That's a cool. pattern. Um, and it's an analog process. It's much simpler than pattern making software that's currently on the market, which is already super outdated. It's from like the late 90s, um, Israeli, and it's not. And then there's the Gerber process, which is super complicated. And then nothing's compatible with anything. So the way patterns, pulling patterns are made is that you make them by hand, then you use a plotter, you scan them. I understood. And then I'm you aware. cut. So what I want to do is go from, and then the 3D scans take forever to like compile, assemble all yeah. the images. So I was just wondering from a resources standpoint, do you have any advice for me? I'm trying to assemble a unique process where it goes from 3D scan, like you pass through, kind of like, do you remember like the phantom toll booth when you were a kid? Yeah. You pass through like the phantom toll I got booth, it. scanned, automatically generates hologram of you in the clothes, kicks it over to the pattern generator, kicks out the pattern to um, a laser cutter that will laser cut the pieces. It's bespoke using the modern technologies that are available. Correct. I totally understand. I totally understand. I totally understand what awesome. you just said. Awesome. So, so I want to do the analog process. I understand the analog process, ins and out, but I can't code worth a shit. I mean, I haven't taken coding since I was an undergrad at Penn. I suck no at it. Like, no problem. Keep I'm going. I'm a lawyer. Yep. How do I leverage my resources to get the tech access that I need? You give five to seven percent of the company to a big time CTO. Okay. Because what the number one mistake that somebody with your pedigree and background makes is they don't realize they're in the technology business and they think they can outsource it. So do not try to hire this out. Think about it. You're in the technology business. Yes. The end. Why the fuck would you outsource something? You need a partner. Now, you don't, partner. you don't need a 49% partner. You don't. You may be able to find a five to 10% partner. You may have to settle for a 49% partner, 
but you have to understand that you're actually in the technology business. The amount of billions of dollars that have been lost in the last four years because people think they can get a tech team in Croatia or fucking Ukraine or India when they're in the technology business is laughable. You're in the technology business. Your unique stores where I fucking go in and fucking scans the fuck out of me and I've got my shit, that's tech. Tech's gonna change. You're not gonna code. Uh, you live where? Uh, here. Pfft, great. There's a lot of tech talent in the general area. So go local with the tech talent? I mean, go wherever you can go, but like, the good news is there's a lot of real fucking talent. The amount of Virginia Tech alumni that can fucking code their asses off, who's 24-year-old Sally, who rip her arm off to 4% of a fashion brand. Got it. Cast a wide enough net to get the people. Okay. Post on LinkedIn, post on your social. You never know when you're fucking former Penn's best friend's aunt's sister's daughter just graduated Georgia Tech and is a fucking ninja and doesn't want to work at Google. And is female empowerment and a female founder, let's fucking go in fashion, yes. Boom, you understand? I do. Find a mentor or somebody that knows how to actually evaluate tech talent. Use your resources to hire somebody for 10,000 bucks to just vet Sally, Rick, and John to figure out who's best at Python. Got it. Got it? Because you can't. The biggest thing that people make mistakes on is they aren't good enough of a judge and then they get caught. Okay. Like if I was trying to, if you were trying to hire a secondary lawyer, you could fucking be the judge. Yeah, I can tell you have a lawyer's stuff. Right, but if somebody's writing Python or fucking Java, you know what the fuck. All right, we hope you enjoyed the show. Hope you enjoyed listening in to our private conversations with Gary V. You know, I know for us, we took back a lot of what he said and implemented the ideas, and we've gotten an amazing return on it already. But I think the bigger return is going to come in the future because a lot of the stuff that Gary talks about, it's not the, you know, make the sale happen right now. A lot of it is building branding, building awareness. And you start to do this thing and all of a sudden, you know, people are just going to think you're everywhere. They're going to see you on social media. You're going to get, you know, emails, texts, direct messages and, you know, people that you never, you know, imagine are just going to be, be coming to you unexpectedly wanting to do business with you because they feel like they know you on social media. Now, it is a lot to, to implement at once. So if you're feeling overwhelmed, don't. Just pick one or two things, implement them, get good at that and then a week later move on to something else. And believe me, the return on investment is there. This stuff works. I got so much out of this conversation with Gary and I hope you did too. And also, what Dan said, a really good point is chunk it down and pick one thing to execute, two things to execute. If you're looking for a community that's focused on action and execution, I encourage you to join our inner circle. It's, it's cheap, it's $40 a month that you can invest in yourself and your business to be on the cutting edge of innovation and be part of the conversations. Okay, here's what Dan and I learned from it and here's how we're executing it in our business. If you're looking to go to the next level and you have a team that you may wanna train or you need better training and skills, you need to know how to navigate com conversations with your clients, whether it's you know how to craft a winning offer or something specific and detailed, we have a VIP in our circle that gets our direct business coaching and access to all of the training that we do for our own team. So we encourage you to check that out. Thank you for joining us for this conversation today with Gary. Many more to come. We look forward to seeing you guys soon.